Genesis chapter 14. <clears throat> Last time we left off at verse, let's see here, uh, 12, 13. Okay, so we left off at verse 13. I'm going to briefly explain 13 again, <clears throat> and then we'll jump to 14. <clears throat> and there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew. So there's one who escaped from the onslaught of, remember, 4 Kings verses 5 at Genesis chapter 14, verse 1 through 12. There were four kings who versed against five kings. Now the five kings were the one who lost. They were Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and Zoar. And remember, Lot was living in that city. So they were all captured by these four kings. One of the people who escaped that onslaught was able to tell Abram, the Hebrew, back at home at Mamre. If you keep reading, <clears throat> for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. So it's basically saying Abram lived in the plain of a location called Mamre. And remember, locations were naturally, commonly, locations were naturally named after the people. So the person who claimed that land is Mamre the Amorite. But there were two other people. You see that Mamre is brother of Eshkol. And then also there's another brother of Aner. Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre are all together within that region because you'll notice these were confederate with Abram. So meaning that they were in unity. They were in the same team, confederacy, with Abram. Verse 14, And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, so Abram heard from the one who escaped that onslaught about Lot being taken captive. Now notice that it says his brother. <clears throat> you'll recall that Abram and Lot that they are not brothers, but rather uncle and nephew. But notice in this passage that Abram, or the Holy Spirit writes, that Abram went to rescue his brother. Now, why would it say that? Go back to Genesis 13. You might recall Genesis 13. Genesis chapter 13. The idea is of brotherhood. So even today, it's commonly used. You go to sororities, fraternities, brothers, sisters, a brotherhood, sisterhood. Sometimes even uh, people who go out on the streets or are part of a gang, they'll say, my brother, right? So if you go to Genesis chapter 13, that's the idea. It's about that closeness, that relationship a brotherhood, so to speak. Verse 8, Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee. So he's speaking to Lot, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. So they are brothers together. Okay, go back to Genesis 14. Genesis chapter 14. <clears throat> now, when we look back at verse 14, let's continue reading that passage. He armed his trained servants, born in his own house. 318. So Abram, he armed his own soldiers, which are his servants. But they are servants that he trained for warfare. So he armed them, gave them weaponry to prepare for battle. And these were servants that were born in his own house. Now remember during the Old Testament and during the ancient times, it was very common to have slaves that time. So Abram, remember he, uh, he had a huge number of slaves when he was in Egypt and perhaps when he was back at Ur of the Chaldees. But he already had his group, uh, his own, I guess, clan, so to speak, his own group of people. So there were servants that were born in his own house that he trained and and grew. Notice that the number is 318. Okay, only 318 people, notice, and pursued them unto Dan. 
Now, notice that he won against these four kings. Now, remember, these four kings are very famous. If you study history of that timeline, perhaps the most ancient city that historians can uh, dig up that was the most powerful is actually when we looked at, uh, let's see right here, if I recall their name, at verse 1, uh, Elam, Elam. So Chedorlaomer, king of Elam. Elam was the most powerful nation that time before uh, Babylonia, which was Babylon later on. Remember, the famous Hammurabi was also living during that time. So Hammurabi teamed up with Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, which is the most powerful nation that time, at verse 1, which I already explained to you last time. And Abram's 318 servants uh, defeated them and pursued them all the way to Dan. Now remember, Abram was here at Mamre, okay? But then he pursued them all the way to Dan. So he was chasing them up north. Now notice how unreasonable this sounds. 318 versus four kings. <laughs> so obviously, your Bible has a mistake. And obviously, what you hear from secular universities and teachers, they're correct that this sounds very unreasonable, so that's why the Bible is a fairy tale. Well, no, that's uh, baloney. If you look at Judges, that's not a problem with the Lord. Look at the book of Judges. He did even smaller than that. He, dr he lost 18 people against an army that was as numerous as the sand of the sea, the Bible says. Look at the book of Judges. We'll look at chapter 7, chapter 7. Now look what the Word of God says. It's so hilarious. The Lord doesn't have a problem with this. At verse 7, Judges 7, 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men, 300, that lapped will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go every man unto his Place. It's not a problem with the Lord. He says that these Jews, they're way outnumbered compared to the Midianites, whose number is as the sand of the sea. But God says, but you know what? These Jews, even though they're outnumbered, they're still too many for me. So send them all home. I only want 300. Amen. That's how the Lord always works. It's not a problem with the Lord. He can use nobody to win a battle. So that's the reason why it's not a problem with us. But if we go back to Genesis 14, the scholars weren't even reading the Bibles carefully. Why? Because they don't care about the Bible. They just like to critique the Bible. So if you look at Genesis chapter 14, you'll notice that they ignored the context of verse 13. Basic biblical hermeneutics. You have to have context. Notice that Abram's not alone. Notice he's confederate with who? Mamre? Ashkol and Aner. So he's already in con uh, confederacy. He already is in team with a different group of people, tribes. So these people were in confederacy with Abram. That's why Abram was able to win. Let's go to verse 15. Verse 15. So you'll see that it's not a problem here. Oh, one more so-called biblical error. If you look at verse 14, notice it says that Abram pursued them to Dan. Well, that's obviously a mistake in your King James Bible, according to the secular professors. Why? Because during that time of Abram, Dan did not exist yet. So obviously that's an error in your King James Bible. But another thing is Moses is the author of this time. So because Moses is the author, the children of Israel, remember, they did not conquer Canaan, which is where Abram's location is. So because the children of Israel did not conquer Canaan yet, the tribe of Dan did not name, claim their location yet that time. This is sometime long in the future. So how did Moses know ahead of time and just write that Dan? He didn't know what he was talking about. Well, no. The reason why is two simple reasons. Well, I'll give three, all right? The first one people aren't going to believe except Christians, but the first reason is... We believe these aren't the words of man, it's the word of God. So if we believe it's God's words, don't you think that when Moses is writing the word, God's going to tell him what to write 
and God knows what that location will be called. Yeah, that's good. Now, it's just common sense if you read your Bible. Yeah. There's a lot of things that God said in His words that the prophets who heard it could not understand it or didn't even believe it. And God says, no, you're supposed to do it. Right. Moses himself, God told Moses, you're going to deliver the Jews out of the hand of Egypt. Moses did not believe in that. He said, who am I? I'm just a shepherd. But God's word proved to be true later on. Yes. So a lot of, that's just normal for God. That's the first reason. Second reason is because Moses is the author of the five books of Moses. We attribute the authorship to him, but we have to understand this. He's not the sole author. He would have people who can continue the writing for him. Let's go to the book of Joshua 24. Joshua 24. The name is attributed to him, but it's common sense when you read books of the Bible. There are books attributed to the name, but they're not the author. Here's an easy example, the book of Esther. Guess what? Esther is not the author, for some of you who didn't know that. Mordecai would be more likely the author of writing the book of Esther. Here's another one, the book of Samuel, First and Second Samuel. Well, obviously, Samuel didn't write Second Samuel. He died, but they attribute it to him. Why? Sometimes they like to attribute the name to the person. Here's an example, Bob Jones University. Well, Bob Jones is dead, but he founded it. See, that's the point. He founded it, but there are people who continue it on. Moses founded the books, the five books, but there are people who continue it on. Same thing with Samuel. He founded it. He started it, but there are people who continued it on. That's got to be common sense. If you understand that, then you'll understand that. <laughs> Joshua chapter 24. Now notice what Joshua said. If you look at verse 26, and Joshua wrote these words in the what? Book of the law of God. Amen. So notice right here that in the law of Moses, that's the writing they had that time. The law of God was the law of Moses, he called it, or the Torah. That he wrote the words in the book of the law of God. So then notice right here, he continued Moses' writings. He continued Moses' writings. And by that time, they already divided up the land. If you read Joshua chapter 21, they already divided the lands. Joshua 19, 20, 21. They divided the lands where Dan would have that portion. Now, here's the third reason. The second reason is probably the more likely reason. But the third reason, which is pretty simple, is that it's very possible before Moses died, he already was thinking about the logistics of the land of Canaan that time. So then he already knew they would conquer, but then he probably discussed with Joshua back then about which tribe would get, would get this portion of the land and this territory. That's very, very possible. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. Now notice right here that you got the answer very simply without Greek and Hebrew. Yeah, come on. Amen. Come on. You, all it takes is just a little common sense and a lead, little reading of the scriptures. Right, right. And I didn't have to dig up a historical source either. That's just actually common sense if you study the Bible. Amen. And not only that, that's historical common sense as well. If you study history, there are some places where you would see contradictions, but it's because people don't understand the context of the environment and the culture of that time. So, or the age of that time. So it's just a little common sense. So any professor, any fool professor would have figured it out if they didn't have the bias already. On, See, they already had the bias. There's a contradiction. There's an error. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 14. Verse 15. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night and smote them. So notice right here that Abram divided himself against the enemies. So because Abram divided himself, let's uh, write this down. He divided himself, him and his servants. That's what the Bible says, right? Against the enemy. Why would it say divided? So in other words, we see a passage in the book of Luke 
Jesus uh, Christ mentioned that uh, his purpose was not to bring uh, peace but a sword, not to cause, uh, not to bring unity but division. See? So the idea of that word dividing against himself or dividing uh, against the others is warfare. It's battling. So the text is pointing out that Abram and his servants were battling against the enemies. That's what it means by divided himself, he and his servants, against what? The four kings. This happened by night, and then he was able to, uh, the Bible says, smote them, meaning that he was able to beat them, kill them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So notice right here that Abram's not done spanking them. At verse 14, he pursued them up to Dan, but he said, no, I'm not done spanking you. You need a little harder spanking. So then he just keeps kicking their tails and then pursues them further north up to Hoba. And then you'll notice that's in the terrain, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So here's Damascus. It's on the left hand over here of Damascus. So you can see that Abram chased them a long ways, a good long ways. Verse 16, and he brought back all the goods. So let me move this side. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Okay, that's self-explanatory. What it means is Abram, he was able to bring all the goods, all the spoils of war that the enemies uh, took from the five kings, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, Zoar. And then he was also able to restore and bring back his brother. And brother is use of the term of brotherhood, remember, or his nephew Lot. And then was able to restore Lot's goods, was able to restore the women there and the people. Now, you'll notice right here, this is very important to understand, and I taught you this last time, the difference between Lot and Abram. Notice that Lot, he chose the good parts of the land, chose to sin, but he lost everything. Abram, he lived right for the Lord, and not only did God bless him in a physical sense, but he was able to bring back and rescue Lot's life and Lot's own sinful goods. Right. And not only that, the place and the location he lived in. All those sinners should be thanking Abram, actually. So a righteous man was able to spare an entire wicked city. So why do you choose the things of this world? Lot almost lost his life, you know, had it not been for Abram. That's the same thing with some of you. You would have lost your own life had it not been for a brother or sister in Christ always saving your tail. So that's why it's so important to live for the Lord. If you don't live for the Lord, you're just a loser like Lot. What a loser. Like, you choose all the goods. You take all the goods for yourself. You're so selfish about it. You want to live your own life, and you lose everything, and you even lose uh, your wife, your daughters, you can't even save them, let alone your own life. And you have to have somebody else who you despised, who you departed from, right? Abram was living right. But Lot despised that, departed from his training upbringing from Abram, and then I had to take that person to rescue his life. Wow. It's like a godly parent who rescues their prodigal child all the time. Right. And the prodigal child is so wicked that it refuses to see that. Just like Lot. Guess what? Lot don't repent. He still goes back to the world. This is a very good story that shows it's not worth living your life into the world and you don't want to waste your life in a prodigal life. You will lose everything. Yes. You know what I believe? I believe that was God's warning to Lot because he almost lost his life. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So then the second time, God's like, no, done's done. And he burned up Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot lost everything had not Abram begged God to spare his life. That's right. That's right. So let that be a lesson. Wow. Let that be a lesson. Don't mess with sin. Don't get enticed by the world and fall into it and think you're so sex successful and smart. That's what everybody thinks, especially during the past two years. You know, it's evident. People think that you got the latest science update and CDC always updates itself. 
It always changes its mind. Look at our, the best programs and technology of government, and like I taught you before, you can't even wipe your own butt. Everyone has to, has to find toilet paper, toilet paper everywhere. What, what, what advancement of our civilization and technology? If you boast about any good or prosperity you have, guess what? You're only looking at the now. Like Lot. Yeah. Lot was looking at the now while living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Look how prosperous I am. Look how well I'm doing. And then just a couple years later, he lost everything. Just a couple years later, the world just lost everything. And they're like, what's going on? And guess what? The world still did not learn their lesson yet. Once uh, they're able to uh, get things normalized and get, become rich again and then become prosperous, guess what? They never learned their lesson. You know what God does? He always does these things to kind of give you a warning like, did you see the light yet? And if you won't see the light yet, then comes that permanent thing, and there's no turning back. Wow. All right, let's go back here. But the last Genesis study, if you would watch that, I showed you the verses on that, so that would be better explained if you look at that. All right, verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return, from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. Okay, let's explain every word and line. So the mayor of San Francisco, excuse me, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram. So he went to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer. So remember, that's the king of Elam. And then Hammurabi and then the other two kings were in confederacy with him. So after he beat them, Abram was returning. So then when he returned, he returned here. That's the location. So then he was returning over here. And of the kings that were with him, so meaning the kings that were allianced with Chedorlaomer, at the Valley of Sheva, which is the King's Dale. So this is the Valley of Sheva, which is the King's Dale. If you compare with other maps, it's pretty kind of confusing, but from what I gathered from most maps, this seems like the approximate terrain because it makes sense. Recall that uh, the four kings, I, didn't, I can't give you the full map. I only am showing you a portion. So this is the Dead Sea, right? And then this is north, and this is Dan. Dan is the most northern part city of the nation of Israel. Okay, so if you can picture it that way. And then right here is the Mediterranean Sea. All right, if you can picture that way, and then here's Syria because Damascus, obviously. Remember that the four kings came right here and then they were conquering land after land after land. Then they went underneath the Dead Sea, all right, close to where the Edomites were. Then they went up from the Dead Sea and then they were going this way, all right? Now notice that they just by a hair missed out Abram. That shows the Lord's divine protection, right? Whereas Lot was smack dab in the middle, so he was caught in the crossfire. So Sodom and Gomorrah was hit right here. And then what happened is that when they were hit right here, Abram came out and then pursued them up to Dan and then pursued them up to Hobah. Then he decides to go back right here at the Kingsdale, Sheva. Why would he meet here? Because this seems like a good middle terrain where Abram can return, that's close to his home, and also where Sodom and Gomorrah is located. So that's the reason why this seems to be the most reasonable spot to meet. In verse 18, and Melchizedek. Okay, here we go. All right, who is this character? Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth, uh, brought forth bread and wine. So the verse is explaining right here that a person named Melchizedek, and notice that he's a king, and he's the king of Salem. It could be that the word means peace right here. So basically, he's king of peace. So wherever this uh, mysterious character Melchizedek is, he just comes out of nowhere, and then he decides to join along. Now, he brings, notice, the bread and wine. Did you notice that? So notice right here, you see the first account of the Lord's Supper. Isn't that important to notice? Oh, wow. 
So then the Lord's Supper, we would say it would start with the Lord Jesus Christ about the bread and the wine. Now, the biblical term for wine is, great, is, wine is grape juice, but I'm not going to explain that in this teaching, okay? So the point is, is that he had the unleavened bread, and then he had the grape juice, and this was the first account. Melchizedek knew about this. That's very strange. This is a very interesting character. Yeah. This guy comes out of nowhere, and he's the one who is familiar of God's ordeals or rituals, God's observances. So this is not your normal human then, perhaps. And he was the priest of the Most High God. So he's the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him. So he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Meaning that, Abram, you are blessed. Uh, notice that Abram's God is the one that receives the blessing, is the one that wins. So that's why it says, of the Most High God. And God is the possessor of heaven and earth. That's self-explanatory. Now, who is Melchizedek? There are so many questions about this character and people wondering who he is. The first thing that we can see the clue is in verse 18. He's the priest of the Most High God. Notice that the next part of verse 19, blessed be Abram of the Most High God. Now look at the wording here. Now notice there's a little bit of a similarity at Genesis 9. Go to Genesis 9. Genesis chapter 9. The first clue or the first proposal that people assume Melchizedek to be is Shem. Some people will assume that it's talking about Shem. The reason why they would think that it's Shem is because during that time, it may have been possible, because remember, people were living longer years, right? So because people were living longer years, it's possible that Shem could have been the one. Because notice that Shem received that same wording from his father Noah. Notice that the wording of Genesis 14 that we read is kind of similar to here. Genesis 9, verse 26. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Now, notice right here, Shem receives a blessing from his father Noah, and the blessing is referring to a spiritual sense. You'll notice that the other sons, it's more physical, right? But then with Shem, it's a spiritual blessing. It's referring to the blessing of the Lord God of Shem. So it has to be religiously, spiritually. So there's a spiritual blessing within Shem. If Shem gets a spiritual blessing, it would make sense that he can be a priest of the Most High God because that's the religion that the Lord puts the attention on, puts the focus on, puts the blessing on. So it follows to reason that Shem, he could have been a priest at verse 18. But notice it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Right? Look at that similar way, structure at verse 19. Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. You see that? Blessed be Abram's God, right? So blessed and then possessive, Abram's God. Genesis 9, blessed and then possessive, Shem's God. Genesis 9, 26. See that? So it's similar. If Shem received that from Noah, it would follow to reason that Shem would say that to somebody else he wants to bestow a blessing on. All right. Now, there's a problem. Go to Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7. The problem is Shem is human. So because Shem is human, this is, does not match him. Because Melchizedek does not seem to be human. He is not a human if you look at Hebrews chapter 7. He's some mysterious character. If you look at Hebrews chapter 7, and then verse 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. All right, Melchizedek is what? At verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abide, abideth the priest continually. So that's too much of a stretch. Yeah. So I don't think that it's Shem. Dr. Ruckman, when he's comparing with people, 
he says that what he's leaning more toward would be Shem. But Dr. Upman says, but the problem is Hebrews 7, 3, if you're going to be honest. The second one is Jesus Christ. So simple, it's Jesus Christ. Problem solved. Uh, be, he's eternal. And you'll notice right here that Jesus Christ is our high priest, right? We know that from the Word of God. So it would fall to reason that it would be Jesus. But the problem is when you look at Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. So notice that this ruins it. Be, uh, because why? Well, first, we can see this is Jesus. But then the problem is this, without mother, right here. We have to understand that Jesus Christ, he does not have a physical father, but he does have a physical earthly mother. Yeah. We have to understand that. Now, it's one thing that God doesn't have a mother. There's this nonsense. That's a whole cult movement, movement called Mother of God movement, which I'm not going to get into. But when we're talking about Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, we can say that Jesus did have a human mother. But there's a way you can argue against this, how, which I'll come to point three later, okay? But I won't do that now. Point is, though, if we want to argue that it's Jesus, we can say that Mary was not born yet, right? So because Mary was not born yet, obviously Jesus existed. So if Jesus existed, it could be him. But the latter part of verse 3 is the puzzle. But made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. So this Melchizedek is like Jesus Christ. He is not, is Jesus Christ. Now, if I'm going to be honest, I don't think that Jesus is like the Son of God. He is the Son of God. So to say that it is Jesus, but he's like the Son of God, and it's kind of a little dangerous, I would say. So I wouldn't say it's Jesus. Now, the third one is the most rational option. The third one is the pre-incarnate state of Jesus Christ. In other words, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord. So this can fit beautifully because... We can see right here that it is not uh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, but it is the angel of the Lord. Now, for some of you who did not understand the theological semantics I just mentioned just now, pre-incarnate state, what in the world is that? So in other words, the incarnation of Christ is when Jesus became a man. Before Jesus became a man, we have to think about this. Throughout the Old Testament... Don't, didn't we see Jesus Christ there, or basically God manifesting himself as a human to people? Yes, a good example is the book of Daniel. At the book of Daniel chapter 3, we see that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw the Son of God in there. But that's Jesus Christ, right? So notice that before Jesus became uh, the official or the realistic Jesus from the Virgin Mary, he did manifest himself as a human before. We see that with the angel of the Lord. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord is actually God. We see that Jacob wrestled uh, with an angel of the Lord and that uh, he mentioned that I have seen God face to face, he would say. We see that other accounts that the angel of the Lord manifest himself to humans, but then these humans realized that it was the Lord that they were seeing. So notice that God manifested in the flesh, but not in our human flesh, so to speak, but like an angel type of flesh, pre-incarnate. So, thus, we call it pre-incarnate state, all right? Before God officially manifested in the flesh, incarnation, pre, all right, before then. So the angel of the Lord sounds the most logical. But there is one good point that Dr. Upman mentions. Look at Judges 13. Judges 13. Judges chapter 13. Notice at verse, uh, let's see, 18. Now, this is undoubtedly, okay, pre-incarnate state of Jesus Christ. 18. And the what? Angel of the Lord. 
unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Why, that sounds like the same thing with Jacob when he wrestled with God, right? The angel of the Lord said, No, I'm not going to give you my name. So that's referring to God then. Hmm. But then we have a problem here. Look at verse 16. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? Now notice that 16 and 17, the angel did not receive homage or some kind of offering. But notice right here that Abram, he offered to Melchizedek, if we look back at Hebrews 7. If we look at Hebrews 7. If we look at Hebrews chapter 7, well, notice that Abram, he did offer something to Melchizedek at verse 2. To whom, see that, verse 2? To whom also Abram gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So notice that Abraham offered to Melchizedek at verse 1. The, he offered him something, but this angel of the Lord didn't receive that offering, which is strange, which is pretty strange. Now, the fourth one is probably the most interesting one. It's not the most rational one. I think number three is the most rational one. But the four is the most interesting one. Let's, uh, you recall all the way back at Genesis 3? Remember all the way back there I mentioned that it may have been possible that Adam and Eve had other children before the fall? Now, if you think of it that way, that Adam and Eve had other children before the fall. And this is what Melchizedek is referring to. Now, that's a whole deep thing, which I'm not going to get into. But there's a book from the Bible Baptist Bookstore. Um, is it called Leviathan? I'm not sure, but I forgot. I think his name is Joseph Dolmage or something like that. But he has a book that covers it, which is intensely interesting. So if we're going to get really, really deep, now, this is not doctrine, okay? This is not doctrine. But I believe that you have to be open to anything, even if it's crazy. You have to be open to anything if there's something in the scripture that leans towards something. Right. That's how you dig deeper. And that's how you understand more of that book. And things start to make more sense. Okay? So then if Adam and Eve had uh, other children before the fall, and I'm not going to go in a defensive manner explaining every detail. I already did that a long time ago. I'm not going to do it in this one. Then... If you recall the teaching that I've shown you last time, the Garden of Eden, remember, is down in the lower part of the earth, right? It's paradise. It's also called paradise. That's where hell is located, the underworld. If it was down there in the underworld, and it's interesting that there are Jewish scholars and Jewish sources who would call it Eden, actually. But Ezekiel, was it Ezekiel? Yeah, Ezekiel was more plain that Eden was down there. Okay, Eden went down there. So then, if Eden is down there, and Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, but they did have children before, it stands to reason that the children were in Eden, all right? And then the children who were able to remain in Eden, but Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, then they went down with paradise to the underworld. Thus, you get what you call the underworld dwellers. And that's where you get into weird conspiracy theory stuff where people talk about hollow earth or uh, something within the center of the earth where there are uh, the underdwellers, they would call it. So the underworld dwellers. Some people would talk about aliens who live down there. Some, uh, one famous diary from Admiral Byrd, which is pretty sketchy, but, uh, I would be, uh, but I'm always open, okay? But it is sketchy. Admiral Byrd, he claimed when he flew over Antarctica, then all of a sudden the world started to change and transform, and then he went to a dif different kind of realm where he was on the center of the earth, and then he claimed that there were aliens down there that he spoke to, communicated with, and that he saw Nazi machinery everywhere and stuff like that. A lot of weird stuff. Now, 
The thing is this, though, is that the point is, is that not that all of it is true or all of it is false, but I wonder if there's some kind of connection right there. Even scholars would admit that with mythology, that there is some kind of historical connection there or some kind of real life event or real life scenario that people start to make stories out of. See that? or to make myths out of. So if we take it that way, there's something that, there is something to it with this. There's something to it. If there is something to it, and Adam and Eve's children were down there, then your answer can easily say Melchizedek is one of those beings. Melchizedek is one of those beings of Adam and Eve's children that dwelt in the underworld. Now this is pretty uh, you can definitely be open to this, and you might say, why is that? The reason why is in Genesis 14, re recall that I taught you at verse 5, notice that, uh, that Chedorlaomer smote the who? Rephaims. Notice that there are already angelic beings who mingled with humans. So there were remnants, so there aren't a whole bunch now, because Noah's flood did the job. But there are remnants of these angelic beings who lived amongst the humans at Genesis 14.5. It also makes sense when you look at historically speaking, the more ancient you go, the more supernatural encounters you'll find. But if you get to more updated centuries, it becomes more secular. It becomes, the supernatural thing becomes more of a fairy tale. Why? Because that supernatural realm has been fading away. It's been fading away. So it would make sense historically speaking as well. And besides, you don't see a Melchizedek every day. It's a rare breed, right? So it's very, so it is possible that there is this rare encounter Abraham, Abram had with some sort of angelic being. But this is not so far-fetched to believe when later on, God himself and two other angels encountered Abraham yeah. later on, right? So it's not too much of a stretch to believe in that. It is very, very deep, I would say, and it can be a little while, but it's not too much of a stretch, actually. It is very possible that this can happen. So then we can see that it's some sort of one of Adam and Eve's other children, maybe. Who knows? So it could be one of those underdwellers, underworld dwellers. That's why the Lord, he remember, he had to put a sword, right? So that Adam and Eve don't enter the Garden of Eden. So there was some sort of access that time, limited access that time. It could be that uh, after Noah's flood, like I taught you last time, it's likely that it was all drowned out. So it may be that before it was all drowned out, there may have been some remnants of those people in that underworld who kind of got out of there. So it may be possible. But this underworld world dweller could be erased and replaced with something simple. It could be referring to an angel. So not the angel of the Lord, but an angel. If we take it that way, it would make sense. Why? Because there is an angel called Gabriel. Uh, there's an archangel called Michael. There's cherubim, seraphim. Up in heaven, there's a whole bunch of angelic beings that you and I don't know about. So it's not too much of a stretch to believe in some sort of angelic being named Melchizedek. And it would fit well because Hebrews 7 says that without father, without mother, and was eternal, right, so to speak. But then the problem then is, is that angels, you know, we can't say that uh, they never had a beginning, right? So I don't think you can go that far. So it is a very mysterious character. It doesn't change that fact. And not only that, because Melchizedek doesn't have a beginning, he won't fit well with an underworld dweller being Adam and Eve's ch other children. So that's why this Melchizedek character is still a very strange character. A majority of Bible believers, modern Bible believers, not the older ones, but modern ones, majority would lean toward this one, number three, the pre-incarnate state. But then you got the question about where he rejected the offering, right? All right, let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis. Chapter 14. <clears throat> and then we'll look at verse 20. Genesis chapter 14, and then we'll read verse 20. So Melchizedek, notice that he's speaking. He's continuing his speech. 
and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Okay, meaning that Melchizedek saying, blessed be God, the Most High God, who what? Who delivered Abraham's enemies into his hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So Abraham, Abram gave tithes of all his goods to Melchizedek. Now what is tithe, right? Tithe is a cuss word nowadays. Uh, uh, I was just thinking that. <laughs> tithe, it means basically tenth. So you notice the closeness of the word right here, right? Mm -hmm. Now there are churches, I'm not going to really get into this, but there are churches nowadays who will start to talk about, you must tithe, you must tithe. And then there are prosperity gospel preachers, they'll say, we demand a tithe out of you or a tenth of all that you have out of you. And then you'll see that in IFB churches. They'll keep arguing tithe, tithe, and then they'll keep using the book of Malachi as their text. The problem, however, is Malachi is an Old Testament passage. Right. <clears throat> and then the tithe is actually referring to sheep, cows, and goods. It's not referring to money-wise, okay? So it's referring to the sheep money, etc. So obviously, uh, the preachers don't know what they're talking about. Send me a tithe of what you've got. Then they're going to have quite a bit of Amazon shipment over to them. <laughs> so they're going to have a, uh, quite a bit of Amazon shipment to them if it, they take it that way with a moon. You know, ah, yeah, and I don't think they'd want the tithe after that. See if Kenneth Copeland would like a tithe after that. <laughs> See, they just want this. See, these guys, they just want this, all right? <laughs> now, you'll notice right here that, so we can see here that the way the churches use tithe is not biblical. However, we don't want to go out of bounds either. We don't want to be out of balance in being so dispensationally minded that we become hyper dispensational. Right. So there are people who go through, through the hyper dispensational nonsense that tithing is unbiblical, so you shouldn't tithe. Well, that's nonsense. What's their logic? What's their rationale for that? Well, their rationale for that is tithing is the Levitical law. True. So tithing is the Levitical law. But guess what? Abram was not under the law. Yeah. So he's not under the law, but he thought, well, notice there was no rule. Right. Yeah. Right. There was like no rule that you have to tithe. But he took it as common sense said, I should give a tenth of what I have to the Lord. Mm -hmm. There's something in the law of his conscience Something in his conscience said, I should give a little bit more to the Lord. Yeah. At the very least, a tenth. Because God deserves a tenth. Or at the very least, a tenth. He deserves your whole life, to be honest. Yeah. So if we just take it as, you know, it's just common sense when the offering plate goes around and then we say that we want to support missions or we want to support the pastor and etc. Mm -hmm. What member sitting in a church you know, has a clean conscience of everybody putting what they have to the Lord and then you just let it pass by you. Right. See, it's a conscience thing. It's a very, it's a conscience thing. But let's look at scriptures if they want to be hyper dispensational. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Amen. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And verse 1. 1st of all, now I put tithe in quote, okay, because the reason why is I cannot prove literally a tenth of what you have, right. but it is a New Testament thing to give. There's a thing called offering or giving, right. and that's a New Testament practice. It may not be the same thing as the Old Testament, but I, am, but I put this in quote. The reason, reason why is this, is that in your conscience, I really believe that a tenth is really the least of what you can give to the Lord. A tenth is the least of what you can give to the Lord. It's more than that. It, this is what I argue. In the New Testament, you're supposed to give way more to the Lord yeah. than the Old Testament. Come on. Amen. Yeah, okay. Amen. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, yeah. verse 1. I'll show you this, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, see, Sunday, not Sabbath, Sunday they gather together for church, let every one of you 
lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. So notice right here, as much as God prospers you, you give as the proportion of much that you can to the Lord. So this verse will show, some people might say, well, I'm too poor, I'm, I'm not able to give a tenth. Well, other preachers preach it differently, but me, I, I let them go because, you know, I'm not in their shoes. And I can understand that there were some times of poverty that I couldn't give a tenth at that time. So I can be understanding. So I'm more merciful compared to other preachers. But other preachers, even if they're poor themselves, they'll say, no, I believe in still giving about a tenth. But the point is right here is that this passage shows you just give the best that you can. That's the bottom line, all right? So then that's why I don't like demand a tenth out of you in this church. That's how I do my church here. But I do argue that you should give the best that you could. Meaning then that if you do have enough money, a tenth is the very minimal to some of you. You can give a lot more if you're going to give the best that you could. The Bible says as much as what? God hath prospered him. All right, so giving the best that you could. So, yeah, I put tithe and quote-unquote. Why? Because this is the very least, to be honest, that you can give to the Lord. Right. All right, look at Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And then we'll look at verse 9. Now, notice that Jesus Christ is contrasted with Melchizedek. And then when Melchizedek received it, notice how the Apostle Paul writes it. Melchizedek received a tithe, and then he argues the Levitical priest also received a tithe. But then he mentions about Jesus Christ being much better. If we look at Hebrews chapter 7, and then we read verse 9, it reads, And as I may so say, Levi also, who received what? Tithe. Paid tithes in Abraham. So notice right here that the Levitical priesthood also received tithes. And then Abram, Abraham in this text also made sure to give tithes at verse uh, 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham. So this is something that the Levitical priesthood received, right? It was natural for the Levitical priesthood to receive tithes for their service. Is that correct? Okay, a tenth. But look at right here. Look at verse 21. But by so much was Jesus made surety of a better testament at verse 22. Verse 21, it says, For those priests, right, the Levitical priests who received tithe, or at least a tenth, Without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear, then will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made surety of a better testament. Now notice right here, Jesus, the verse argues Jesus is a better priest than those Levitical priests. Right, right. Now, the Bible says Jesus' service is better than the Levitical priest's service. Right. Now, if it was common sense that for the Levitical priest's service, you give a tenth, and Jesus Christ's service is better than the Levitical priest's service, yeah. don't you think it's common sense to give, no, not a tenth, but more? Yeah. Wow. Now, don't be hyper-dispensational on me. You know, the people who tend to post videos on that online uh, teach that, you know who, who those people tend to be? People who, do, who are stingy, who probably didn't give much to the Lord. Sometimes you have to think and pray about that. Now, I understand that there are wolves out there, and there are people who address those wolves, and I'm for that. I expose that. I, I hate that nonsense out there. You know, by the grace of God, I never preached a sermon on tithing. You know that? Never one time in 10 years did I preach a sermon on the subject of tithing. Why? Because I believe that the Lord has to deal with your heart to give to me, and I don't have to reach it out of you. At the beginning, when we started online, I never set up a PayPal or any kind of monetary giving. But because I got too many emails and letters from people, please tell us where to give the money to. And me, I'm like, well, no, it's okay. I don't, uh, I don't want it off of you. But because I felt sorry for the people because they just keep bothering me with that, I was like, okay, here's the label. This is where you can give, okay? So that's why I posted over there. 
And then you got the onliners who say, oh, look at that, he's just begging for money. You, I can't please anybody nowadays. Whether I post uh, give money or I don't post to give money, I'm going to get complaints either way, okay? So you know what? I could care less about what onliners say about me. You know, I'll just say whatever I want because it's between me and God. I'm more scared of him than what onliners think about me, okay? All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9. I mean... Uh, I've been called worse, you know. I've been called worse. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll look at verse 6 and 7. Verses 6 and 7. Now notice that it is a command to give in Scripture. The Bible says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly, this is so important. Not grudgingly or of what? Necessity. So you don't give because you have to. You don't give it because you have a bad spirit about it. It's for God loveth a cheerful giver. You give it because you have a cheerful, happy attitude to do it. You know, a great example is when we have a guest speaker here. Man, I'm really proud of this church on how much you gave. Even at a time, long time ago, when I only had four people and I was worried, oh man, did the missionary get enough? They got enough. Yeah. They got not enough. In fact, I never saw a missionary feel so embarrassed and said, oh no, brother, here, let me give some of it back to you. And I said, no, 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 you keep it. Our church wanted to give it to you. And there was a cheerful spirit about it. It wasn't grudging. Yes. So I never had to preach a sermon on tithing to you guys. So praise the Lord for that one. Now, if we're supposed to give, notice right here what's condemned. Yeah. He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. If you think that, nah, I can't give a tithe, it's too much, are you sparing your giving? Yeah. Can you honestly say a tenth of what you got is bountiful to the Lord? See, so then that's the thing, is that spare, sparing your offering is not recommended. That's why I put this on quote, because it's not really a tithe. What God wants is the best that you've got. That's the bottom line. Yeah. But if you want to spare that because it's too much for you, I would, I, would, I would like to see all these Christians back in the Old Testament time, during persecuted times, how much they gave to the Lord, and then let's see how much you say, this is too much to the Lord, and those people gave more to the Lord. All right, now you go home and think and pray about that for a while. All right, back at Genesis 14. Genesis 14. Genesis chapter 14. So notice that this is a New Testament practice, and yes, we will practice it. All right, we will practice it. I don't care if it's just one member and me. Me and the member will give money to the Lord, all right? If you won't give, I'm going to give to the Lord. Amen. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 14. And by the way, I'm giving away my salary, you got to realize, guys. I'm giving up my salary too at times when I'm giving the offering to the Lord. So I can't just go by my salary and think that's enough to make it through the day. So we all give. The point is all of us work. And all of us give a portion of our salary to the Lord. That's the bottom line. Okay, let's look at Genesis chapter 14. Notice right here that at verse 20, that Abram gave Melchizedek tithes of everything he had. And the verse 21 through 24 will comment in our next Genesis Bible study. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's Genesis study was a blessing to the hearers. And I also want to pray that we'll, you'll continually increase our knowledge in the Scriptures into understanding every word from that precious book. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 All right.